back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Black market bots are untraceable killers. We got that deadly story, plus good news about little free libraries. But first, amid another war provocation, which wasn't the chemical weapons attack we were kind of warning about last week, not yet anyway, but as the Israeli, Syrian, U.S., Russia proxy wars show us, I think, kind of the lies and the subterfuge and the fog of war kind of right now in the present day, I think it's also instructive to look at the recent past for a whole heck of a lot of perspective. Norway officials admit they knew nothing about Libya, but joined regime change efforts anyway. A new official report produced by the Norwegian government illustrates the continuing absurdity of NATO expansion and foreign adventurism in places very far away from the North Atlantic, seemingly explicit in the name North Atlantic Treaty Organization, far-flung places like Afghanistan, Libya, Ukraine, or Syria. Top Norwegian officials have now admitted they had very limited knowledge of events unfolding in Libya during 2010-2011 prior to NATO's military intervention on behalf of anti-Gaddafi rebels, a war that resulted in regime change, a failed state ruled by competing governments, extremist militias, and of course, as we've reported for you here, open slave trade to this day. Norway enthusiastically joined the U.S., U.K., and French-led bombing of the country initiated in March of 2011, even knowing full well its military knew next to nothing of what was unfolding on the ground. The commission report states that there were no written sources that so much as attempted to assess the nature of the conflict Norway was about to, adjo- to join. Officials failed to assess the type of conflict Norway was taking part in. NATO's a cult name for the operation was the U.S. codename Operation Odyssey Dawn, and Norway flew 596 strike missions during the first five months of the NATO intervention, dropping 588 bombs on Libyan targets. Norway had provided six F-16 fighter jets, and its pilots were reported to have conducted 10% of all coalition strikes against pro gaddafi forces. We can include the PDF of this report, Evaluation of Norway Participation in Libya Operations in 2011. It is, unfortunately, for those who don't speak Norwegian, all in Norwegian, but you can probably easily throw it into a translator. And there are other sources who, of course, have translated this report. Now, lest you think that the uh, we came, we saw, he died mentality was the previous puppet administration's kind of bag. This from less than a year ago, in a year into America's next top president's run, Norway receives first F-35 fighter jets from Lockheed Martin, uh, of course, right after the U.S., Israel, and Italy. James? Yes, this story is galling and disgusting and completely expected, unfortunately. And there is no solace in being right about this, because being right about the headlong rush into war and the stupidity of it and the stupidity of the politicians that make that decision uh, is unfortunately paid for with the blood of many innocent civilians. So there is, there's truly no solace here in being right. But hey, here we told you so. We've been talking about this since before the operation even began, that this is going to be a disaster. And it turned out to be a disaster exactly as we predicted. But unfortunately, the Norwegian government wasn't listening to James Corbett and James Evan Pilato. It was listening to CNN and whatever else, as they now openly admit, well, we were just getting our information from the media. Well, you know, who, who would have thought they'd be wrong about the, the wonderful, virtuous na- nature of this operation to go save Libya by bombing it to smithereens? Who could have thought that would turn out disastrous besides us and probably most of the people watching this program right now. Anyway, um, again, it's disgusting, it's despicable, but not at all unexpected. And uh, to fill in a little bit more of that history of what NATO is and how it functions and how the entire NATO organization can be steamrolled into going along with wars, I will humbly point people in the direction of my recent work on the Afghanistan war, still ongoing and still a source of contention and, uh, and bloodshed 17 years later after NATO went in based on its Article 5 invocation. And for people who don't know that story, please go to CorbettReport.com slash Afghan War. The link will be in the show notes, of course, to get that fuller story. And uh, also, I would recommend watching my uh, interview with Niels Herrett, the full interview where we talk about that and the the ramifications of this and what it means. And he was talking specifically in that uh, interview about watching the people sort of lining up to sign on to the uh, Afghan war and, and seeing 
literally being able to see what it looks like for uh, the entire NATO organization to just be steamrolled. And no one's going, Norway isn't going to stand up and say, no, we won't go along with this if all of the other NATO nations are going along with it. And here's a, a perfect example in black and white, if you happen to read Norwegian. If not, there are some articles talking about this document anyway, and we'll direct you in that direction. But again, uh, there's no solace in being right about uh, war, um, but war always leads to disaster like this. War is never the solution, and it's never going to bring freedom and happiness and sunshine and rainbows, as the NATO propagandists in their mouthpiece on CNN will tell you and the Norwegian government. James, it, it actually kind of struck me there. It, I, I had to realize we did report on the full invasion of Libya as it was unfolding because we've actually been doing this. It'll be nine years next month, James. Our second story this week on episode 352 of New World Next Week gets even a little deadlier. I guess we go sort of from death from above to just right on the ground floor. Killer robot assassins to be sold on black market advertising untraceable murders. Criminal gangs and terrorists could get their hands on murderous artificial intelligence to hunt down enemy targets. And by being controlled at length, they can make it impossible for the culprits to be traced. Computer engineer Dr. Subhash Kak warned the parts needed to assemble killer robots will prove not difficult to buy on the black market. And before long, he said the robots themselves will be available to buy, ready to carry out mass murder upon instruction. This Oklahoma University lecture was talking to the Daily Star online where we grab this story from. And again, everything we say and play will always be included down in the show notes. The Oklahoma University lecture told the Daily Star online, quote, the technology for human assisted killer robots is already here. Bad actors will be able to produce these using parts that are not too difficult to buy on the open market or just get them on the black market. The possibility of untraceable terror attacks will increase. His comments come amid furious debate over the use of autonomous killer robots by countries on the battlefield, major countries including the U.S. and Russia opposed a treaty banning them, sparking outrage from the campaign group Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. Dr. Kak previously told the Daily Star online he believes AI brains can become radicalized for terror attacks. Malfunctioning robot brains may produce behavior like that of radicalized humans. There could be a bug in the code. And we'll include the link back to their original report, Killer Robot Ban, blocked by shameful U.S. and Russia. James, this story is even just sort of, as the words are coming out of my mouth, it's like, this sounds insane, but it's here and it's now. Yeah, exactly. Welcome to the insanity of the 21st century. And uh, here we are, we're in the middle of it. And it raises all sorts of questions on a lot of different issues. And it touches on so many key points that we are living through right now. And we better have answers for these questions because here they come, uh, including the just the, the, the question posed by the very existence of these technologies, these types of little drone bots that'll be able to fly into someone's living room without them even noticing because it looks like a mosquito and inject, you know, some deadly serum or whatever. I mean, come up with whatever insane, wacky sci-fi plot you can, and it's going to be here in the near future. And the question is, what do we do when technology like that exists? Because technology like that is fundamentally not controllable. It may be regulatable, and certainly governments of the world will try to regulate the the production and sale of these types of technologies, but there's going to be a market for it. So it's only a question whether it's a white market or a black market, and the black markets are already arising, and they're already talking about this as a, uh, as a very near-term possibility. And, well, not just possibility, I mean, guaranteed, it's coming. So the, then the question is, well, what what's the real answer here? Can you just sit there and sit there on your hands and hope that, oh, I hope government can contain these types of technologies, not just the drone bot killer whatever AI things, but also, I mean, the, the CRISPR gene editing that you can do in your kitchen tabletop to create the next super bug or whatever. All of these technologies are coming online and are becoming, coming to the point where you can literally do them yourself. Um, again, that's not controllable. So here we have this mass radical decentralization that is taking place within the framework of governments trying to regulate and control everything. And uh, if we just sit there and wait for governments to protect us from these things, I think we're probably going to end up dead. So 
there's, again, some very big questions here about how do we actually proceed with this and what do we do with this and who is going to be able to protect themselves? Will it only be the people who participate in that black market and, and uh, you know, per- and purchase their own private drone army to protect them? And, I mean, again, insanity. This sounds crazy, but here we are, 21st century, you know, time to, time to wake up and smell the autonomous robots. Um, and let me just throw another thing into this mix. Just, to make, just in case that wasn't enough for you, I uh, wrote an editorial not too long ago, a couple months ago, how to bet on absolutely anything, talking about how decentralized gambling, essentially, or prediction markets have arisen on the blockchain, and they are now, of course, as soon as that happened, they started to enable the first assassination markets. And this is where things are going. In fact, they are already here. And again... Unless we start talking, at least having this conversation uh, beyond just, oh, what will government do about it? Unless we start having this conversation, I think it may be game over very soon. So uh, uh, incredibly important story. But (laughs) again, to to most people, they'll laugh it off until it is too late. So it's really interesting that you mentioned essentially crowdsourcing assassinations. I mentioned this story about the the killer robots on my Morning Monarchy a couple of mornings ago, and I made the sidebar mention there's a brand new comic book from Image Comics. It's already been – it's, what, two issues in, and they've already optioned to turn it into a movie. It's called Crowded. It's about the future of crowdsourced assassination, and it looks like a Black Mirror episode. So, again, the artists are already and have been already sort of talking about these things. James, the other interesting bit I wanted to ask you, did speaking of talking about killer robots, did you catch the Elon Musk on Joe Rogan? I saw the first hour of it anyway. That's that's pretty much what I saw and kind of – and watched it live – there were moments where it was I've, – I've compared it. He was like the Rutger Hauer speech at the end of Blade Runner. It was just that's, – that's our 2018 world, and we are in desperate need of a little bit of good news, and that's what we'll do for our third and final segment on this New World Next Week episode. There are now 75,000 little free libraries around the world. What started as a modest literacy project in 2009 has grown into a worldwide phenomenon. You've probably seen them, anyone around the world. Little free libraries. Tiny houses, not not to be confused with tiny houses, they actually, they sort of look like giant bird feeders or a dog house that you maybe put up on a stick. They're filled with books that can be placed in your front yard. Leave a book, take a book. Todd Bowl started it in Hudson, Wisconsin back in 2009 after putting one in his front yard. They definitely started showing up pretty quickly after that in the uber hip city of Portland where I lived at the time. Nine years later, they are celebrating the 75,000 Little Free Library, which was placed in Jinx, Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago. Similar community sharing ideas have also manifested in the forms of Little Free Pantries, Community Fridges or clothing libraries, all of which I've talked about on Good News Next Week episodes. We will include in the show notes for this episode the actual blueprints and plans on how to build your own little free library. James, i got to ask you, it's another question for you. Do you see these, have you seen these in Japan? I haven't, but I will keep my eye out for them. I think it's a great idea. Um, but I well, have noticed there in, in Japan there is a general more... Uh, community centers and, and places like that where they do have these types of um, free libraries anyway. So um, it's not quite on the street level, but there is a there's sort of a more grassroots thing happening here. Anyway, I'm uh, very interested and excited and, yes, relieved to have a little bit of good news. So thank you for bringing that to us. <laughs> Absolutely. So I can even give you a little bit more good news as we wrap this episode up. I've got the latest episode of my Good News Next Week series. It talks about how CBD can help your brain. Bad things do happen to bad people, and a high court confirms what we already knew. Sharing food is not a crime. James, as I always like to say, I do stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time. And I do have a new website and kind of a whole media monarchy makeover in the works. Would love to see people join and help out in the media monarchy community. James? Well, as you say, it's been nine years now, almost nine years of doing this. And we've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships (laughs) on fire off the shoulder of Tripoli. And we watched uh, molten steel glowing in the dark near World Trade Center. And all these moments will be lost in time, like tears in the rain. Time to die. All right, anyway. Did you know that off the top of your head? 
<laughs> uh, no, I quickly looked it up, but wouldn't okay. that be funny? <laughs> anyway, uh, I think that'll do it for this week. What do you say? I think so. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> All right. Talk to you next week. All right.